So what a wonderful thing. I'm going to talk tonight to Dr. Stephen Greer. I've wanted to talk with him uh, again for some time. He is the founder of the Disclosure Project, which is the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Orion Project in Serious Technology Advanced Research. Let me just tell you that I think this is a, a really apropos moment to talk to Dr. Stephen Greer because of what on earth is going on in uh, this country with the election, the health, the um, mental health, and the um, kind of uh, exposure of how angry everybody is. Uh, I am in a way glad to talk on September 11th. Of course, we all remember where we were and what we were doing. But Dr. Stephen Greer is the father of the disclosure movement and he had a wonderful moment in May of 2001, um, a National Press Club event, which I watched, and so did over one billion people. And he was talking about um, the existence of extraterrestrial life forms visiting the planet potentially, and the reverse engineering of the energy and the propulsion systems of those crafts. Now, since I live in New Mexico, and of course everybody knows about Roswell, I've been interested in that for years and years too. So I can't wait to talk to Dr. Greer, which I hope he allows me to call him Stephen. He's been a lifetime member of Alpha Omega Alpha, which is the nation's most prestigious medical honor society, which I think is kind of interesting since we're talking about the different energies of the above and here. And he um, was, during his life and career, uh, the chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Caldwell Memorial Hospital in North Carolina. Some of you might have read his books. He's the author of four of them, and he talks about this. By the way, what's interesting to me really deeply is that he has studied Sanskrit and the Vedas extensively, and I spent a lot of time in India trying to understand whether there had really been um, extraterrestrial visitation and potentially a war in India thousands of years ago. Anyway, he's been seen and heard by millions worldwide on CBS, BBC, Joe Reagan, Discovery Channel, and now he'll be heard on my show. I am really privileged and honored to have you. Welcome, Dr. Stephen M. Greer. May I call you Stephen? Sure, you can call me anything you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> don't don't give me that freedom. <laughs> no, no, you're, it's really I'm very happy to be on the show with you. I'm been looking forward to it. Thank you. Now this disclosure project, of course, I've been watching and stuff. Tell us how it's going and kind of what it is, and that'll start us off. And then I've got a bunch of stuff to ask you. Well, really, we're in the whole new phase of it. We just um, launched a campaign where, uh, essentially, I concluded after we briefed the Clinton presidency and, and their CIA director back in the 90s that this is something that people are going to have to do. And yeah. uh, I had never intended to get involved in this at this level. And, you know, I have uh, four children and had an emergency medicine career. And uh, my real interest in this subject it stems from experiences I had when I was a late teenager. Uh, I had a near-death experience and then became a uh, Sanskrit scholar of the Vedas and then a meditation teacher. And I was really interested in the nexus of where consciousness and higher states of consciousness interface with mm -hmm. interstellar communication and technology. And this became a really big focus of mine for, you know, for over the last 40 years. But Stephen, wait a minute. Let me ask you: when you when you had your near death experience, first of all, what caused that? And second, is that when you started to be interested in the Vedas? Yes, I was raised a very devout atheist, <laughs> and um, <laughs> my 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 family didn't believe in anything if it didn't exist in a test tube. And as you may know, mm -hmm. my um, my mother's um, brother was one of the guys who designed the lunar module that put the first man on the moon. His company was Northrop Grumman. And so what happened is I was being a, a stupid teenager guy, and I had an injury on my left leg and bicycled 200 miles in one day, and it spread all through that infection all through my system. Ooh. And um, I was raised very poor, 
Um, we didn't have anything. We didn't have doctors, so I didn't go see a doctor. And I just got sicker and mm. sicker and had a near-death experience, which I spontaneously healed from this injury. Never did mm. go see a physician. That's another whole long story that's in my first uh, one of my books called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that I had an out-of-body experience. And for me, the experience was about the experience of the true nature of the conscious mind in its infinite form. So I went out into space and became sort of this infinite mind shining within the vessel of my individuality or through the vessel of my individuality. And it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And from that, I became incredibly interested in what the nature of consciousness is and the mind um, and these issues. And it led me into the study of the Vedas. And eventually I became a meditation teacher and went all over the world setting up meditation teachers. And this predates my medical career um, in my mm -hmm. late teens and early 20s. In my misspent youth, as I joke, although while most people were doing crazy things like that, I was, you know, ex exploring consciousness. But mm -hmm. it really was a great foundation for what I eventually did in medicine and understanding the human condition, but also with the extraterrestrial question of when you become an interstellar civilization, what is that reality? And you realize it's transdimensional. It's a conscious reality that the cosmos is awake and their technologies interface with thought and consciousness. And this was mm. led me to this, this concept of making contact with these civilizations using a number of, of technologies, uh, lasers and other things, but primarily through the conscious field and higher states of consciousness. So mm. that's really what got me started. Now, when I started that project, which is called the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, or CE5 Initiative, we mm -hmm. had these craft appear right over us in Florida. And mm. people can go to our website, seriousdisclosure.com, and see these. But what happened is that there were people, I, did, I didn't know all of them, who were embedded at that first event who were from the intelligence community. And these were friendly people in the military and intelligence community. <laughs> oh, really? Now, these, yes, because this is a matter of really beyond top secret interest. So sure. within a few months, I was being invited to briefings with the head of Army Intelligence and what have you. And within about a year, I was asked to brief President Clinton, CIA director, on this issue. How and old were you then? I was 30, mid-30s. Mid I was in my mid-30s okay. then. Okay. And it was a bit bit intimidating, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm a you know a doctor in North Carolina and living kind of a normal life. I mean, I, I think normalcy is greatly overrated, frankly. But why um, <laughs> <laughs> pretend? But uh, I was, I, I, you know, to the extent one could, having had my background. But what was shocking to me is that I discovered that both the, the Clintons and their CIA director were being denied but access. Yeah, no, the CIA director was R. James Woolsey. Podesta had been the chief of staff for them. And but then he was what very we, interested in this stuff, wasn't he? Oh, he still is. And if, he, you know, if you've yeah. been following the campaign with Hillary, he's the campaign chairman, and he and Hillary both have been speaking openly about UFO disclosure yes. yeah. during the right. last year. But right. when I started this effort, it was really an accident of history, I guess is what I'm saying, because I really never intended to get involved with this end of it. But I started doing kind of shuttle diplomacy up to the U.N. with Boutrous Boutrous Ghali and into Washington meeting with members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and Senate Intelligence Committee members, et cetera, and so on. And mm -hmm. people were extremely interested. But what I discovered, and this gets us to what we're doing right now um, with this new project, is that these projects are so deep black that they're called unacknowledged special access projects. <laughs> now, the, that, that's the title. That's the title of the documentary we're doing right now. We're doing a documentary that's going to be so explosive, and I hope you can come as my guest <laughs> to the premiere when we get it finished. Oh, I'd time. love to, Stephen. Oh, I'd love to. Absolutely. And that you'll I'd, certainly I'd be, in... be. I'd like to be unacknowledged too. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'll come in as disguise as Mr. Magoo, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking. But I think that the the, the this led to a series of of uh, discoveries on our part, not just my part, but my military advisors and people like that who began to come around this project for the disclosure project, and that is. There's almost two parallel worlds out there. There's the world that the president and the Congress normally deal with, with you know terrorism and taxes and Medicare and what have you. And then mm-hmm. there's the world of the UFO issue and extraterrestrial intelligence. And beginning in the 1950s, from the best we can reconstruct, on Eisenhower's watch, these operations went completely unacknowledged, meaning so black that they would not acknowledge their existence. Mm-hmm. So a special access project is, you know, that those are a dime a dozen. There's no, you know, 900,000 people with top secret clearances and various special access projects. Let but me unacknowledge- stop for a second, Stephen. Why did it go so far under? What well, their acknowledge- what, what is What was their reasoning? Well, the reason for it is because once they realized what the technologies were behind these interstellar vehicles, such as the objects that went down in Roswell, and they did. There were three of them, actually, that crashed there, Um, not one. And once those began to be studied and they figured out the energy and propulsion systems, they realized that we would, if that was known to the planet, that we would no longer need oil or gas or coal or got it. utilities. Got it. And there so, goes the global elite and the Illuminati and all the global rich people. Exactly. You're, you're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets. Mm. So not okay. billions. No one cares about a billion dollars anymore, unfortunately. It's, yeah. hundreds, it's trillions. So when, what, what I discovered, and this is what I've discussed with um, – uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, the former Minister of Defense of Canada, who is actually Wonderful a macro economic, yeah, he's a macroeconomics guy, and mm-hmm. he said and he didn't understand the secrecy, and neither did the CIA director for mm-hmm. Bill Clinton back in the '90s. And I said, look, these technologies are so advanced that it would completely replace all the sources of pollution. We would have instead of 48 percent of the world's population literally not have enough a pot to pee in, we would have a completely transformed and macroeconomic system that would lift mm-hmm. all tides, except for the uber elite that want to keep mm-hmm. the world right. as it is. So once this was recognized, they slammed the door on this so hard you can't even, it was breathtaking. And they betrayed mm-hmm. Eisenhower. This is why Eisenhower made that famous yeah. speech, beware the military right. industrial right. complex. I mean, he Absolutely. was an anti-military. He was a five-star general, for God's sake. Right, right. So... But the technology part of this is the part of the story that has never been told. And this documentary we're doing, which right now is is one of the top crowdfunded documentaries in history called Unacknowledged, we're we're in post-production right now, Mm -hmm. has dozens of these top secret whistleblowers, missile, uh, military whistleblowers, including one man who admits to the extent to which he is a counterintelligence officer, carried mm-hmm. bags of cash to people in the mainstream media <laughs> to get them to cover this story up. Yeah. So, no, we have amazing, in fact, I was just in New Mexico um, in July interviewing this uh, lieutenant colonel. And mm-hmm. so what you discover as you go through this narrative is that it's really not that hard to understand what the secrecy about. It's really about power and and lots of it. Um, well, so, it's really basically about money. And money. But money is really a symbol for power, you see. Mm-hmm. Because when you talk mm-hmm. about pa- money for me is can I put my kids through college? Money mm-hmm. for these guys is a symbol for massive macroeconomic geopolitical power. But let me so, let me insert a question here, Steve. Sure. Um, when you look at, as I figured out quite some time ago, the technology was the reason for the secrecy because that would render ineffective the money and power of the global elite, whatever right. you want to call them. Sure. But what I'm wondering is, is there another off-world civilization who likes the idea of the money and power uh, symbology? Keeping I see it. Well, that, that's a popular idea. I don't see any evidence for it. I think actually what's happening is that if you look from 1940s to now, 
their big concern is that we have become an existential threat to not only ourselves, but potentially to other star systems because yeah, the universe. Well, you know, it's not just hydrogen and uh, bombs and atomic bombs, although that started the whole modern era of UFOs being seen, but they've been around for thousands. Of, I think they've been around mm-hmm. for millions of years, to be honest with you. I think there's Is that why you got so in- interested in the Vedas, and, and did you actually speak Sanskrit? Yes, I um, I used to tutor people in Sanskrit, and, right. um, yeah. And so you were, the, you were, you had a relationship with that reality, probably, and old Vedic terms in India, correct, don't you think? I do, yes. And and yeah. this is actually how, uh, in fact, I've just come from the desert. We were up in the center of Joshua Tree National Park doing a CE5 event where we had um, the most amazing contact events happen with this group of people that I was training. And uh, I think that we have the ability to move past this sort of cul-de-sac we're stuck in. It's sort of like a little... Uh, eddy going around in circles where we've been stuck for a hundred years on our civilization using sort of 1800s, uh, ni- uh, 19, uh, early 19th century um, and uh, 20th century technologies that where we first started burning things to turn turbines and what have you for energy and power. But the power elites don't really want us to get to that next level. You know, I meet, I meet with people in Silicon Valley all the time and they're so proud of all their technologies. But I go, you know what, your your iPhone is being charged off of a coal-fired power grid from the 1800s. Sure. So sure. we have to begin to look at what our civilization is doing and how it's ended up in this situation. And what we're doing with this new documentary called Unacknowledged is to connect those dots for people. You know, what's the connection between uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, UFOs, and the history of this? and these secret technologies, and how is the secrecy kept in place, and what can we, the average person, do about it? Now, what I ended up concluding after, you know, about seven years of dealing with folks in Washington is, as you mentioned, the 2001 National Press Club event a few months Mm. in May of 2001, just before 9-11. We Mm. put together a few dozen of these whistleblowers, and we put them forward. And actually, I met with so many people, like uh, we have a mutual friend, uh, Dennis Kucinich, and and others Mm -hmm. who were really extremely interested in the issue, but nobody really wanted to hold open hearings on it because of the ridicule factor. They don't want Mm -hmm. to be made fun of. Humiliation is their big weapon. Yes. And, you know, this we found, uh, you know, I have a CIA document from 1953 where it speaks of engaging Disney Studios to to make cartoons (laughs) and make fun of the ET issues so that it would be ridiculed. And right. what you find is that there has been such manipulation of this subject in the in the mainstream media and also yeah. in Hollywood, I hate to say it. No uh, question. That, but yeah. every time, let's see, and every time I ask heads of studios, heads of the television network, what the hell are you doing with this fear and the ETs destroying us and blah, blah. Every one of them says, God, it makes so much money. So we're talking materialism here, basically, not so much power, unless they are right. believing that they're missions and that, uh, that come out of some of this fear mongering makes them money. They just are are stuck in materialism. That to me has become the new religion. And yes, I'm, it is. But 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 that doesn't explain all of it, Shirley. Think about the fact mm-hmm. that Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And the movie right. E.T. were some of the biggest grossing movies in history. Well, they're scared and, of Stephen because Stephen can really hit him in the butt, and they're afraid of him. And so he, but then he goes and makes uh, cowboys and aliens or some damn thing. And well, that's you think, well, what are you trying to prove now? It, well, yes, but the, but there's a there's a big backstory to all of that, and and the ones that are like the movies Independence Day, that is out of cent- central script writing from the CIA. Those those mm-hmm. narratives which make their way into movies today, which are so mm-hmm. fear mongering, have to do with what Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, warned us about. Yeah. He said, he mm-hmm. said. We're going to hoax. We're going to create a situation of the Cold War. Then there's going to be uh, nations of concern, and then there's going to be global terrorism. Now, we came out with this testimony back before 9-11. 
And then after that, there'll be the threat from outer space. And he says it's all a lie. It's all completely a lie. No, and the, re- well, okay, the reason, but, is, you know, and and, and, yeah. and the reason is, is that, you know, right now we're spending, what, trillion dollars chasing around a handful of terrorists in the Middle East. To grow the military-industrial right. complex, you got to have a new Understood. boogeyman. And okay, I, I think they're, I think they're trying to create a boogeyman. Well, of course they are. And it all came out of Project Paperclip, at which he was one of the heads. So Correct. with Project Paperclip's kind of futuristic idea of, okay, and the last thing you'll be afraid of, after uh, communism, after terrorism, after asteroids, now you've got ETs. Right. What is after ETs? And that's why I'm wondering, who were these Nazis? Who was... Uh, Werder von Braun, actually, and who were, uh, and how come they let the Eisenhower out? What is it that was on their minds to make a lot of money or to take over this beautiful planet on some level of consciousness, even? Yeah, well, I think that it's both, but I think that you, you have to understand what I, how I understand this, at least, of what I've learned from running in these circles for too many years, I'm afraid, is that there's, a need to conglomerate power around central authority figures. And the ultimate one is, is, you know, Big Brother, uh, the military uh, industrial system. And you, you, they would like to, you know, one of the narratives in the movie Independence Day was, you know, when Will Smith said, let's go kick alien butt. And they showed people from yeah. all over the world, from Arabia. Yeah, let's get into this fight. There's this sort of jingoistic and childish mentality of uniting people, not around something beautiful, that we're not alone in the universe, that we can evolve through higher states of consciousness, that we can become interstellar, but around some sort of Manichaean worldview and that there's some threat out there, but that also through fear, whether it's through conventional orthodox religion or government systems, fear controls the masses. So it's well, that's fear. the point. That's my question. Is this kind of off-world manipulation so exquisitely of the natural uh, accommodation to fear? I mean, I'm, I doubt I it's off-world. I think it's the nature of, I, well, frankly, I think it's just a, one of the, the, the foibles of human nature. I don't think there's anything off-world about it. First of all, if there was a, th- a threat from off-world that wanted to do this, it would have been done a very long time ago. But I think it's more likely, what's more likely is, is the demagogues who have existed in every generation have yeah. figured out how to use this subject for demagoguery and for fear-mongering and uh, the acquisition of, as Eisenhower said, unwarranted power. And that, I think, is something we, the people, have to resist and understand, and the only way to do that is to awaken to it and to mm-hmm. acknowledge it. So we want to take unacknowledged and make it acknowledged. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's the whole point. The first step is, as in the Vedas, it says knowledge is the greatest purifier. If we can bring the information out and show people a path to how we can deal with this and empower ourselves to take this matter into the hands of the people, to mm-hmm. make contact, to bring out the sciences and technologies. I mean, why do we go along with the secrecy that we're using oil in our engine still? We have the ability to put teams <laughs> together. I mean, this mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Um, and we need people to be coming together to develop these sciences and technologies independent of large corporations and the government. That's a big right. part of what, what I've been calling for. And but I think let me once, ask you, let me interfere once more here. Sure. Um, and I think what I'm going to basically bring up is religion is a huge reason for this, because if the technologies of these other star nations are not anything separate from consciousness, even if the technology is literally the speed of consciousness and they have learned how to manipulate their own tie to the complete enlightenment of themselves, then what is uh, what is what is the church going to do about that? Well, they're going to have to grow up. And uh, <laughs> although you know, I had a great conversation at, at the Vatican about this, and uh, with Monsignor Balducci, who was a senior advisor to the Pope, 
and uh, his his view on this was actually quite enlightened and understands now the the problem with all of this happening i had a man at the jet jet propulsion labs i was meeting with who had imaged some of the really old structures on mars you know, Buzz Aldrin has called for going back to, to Mars and examining the obelisks and other things that are there, and they are there. Mm. And this mm. man said, I said, well, why don't you at least disclose those? Because those are ancient. He says, because mm. it would collapse the orthodox fundamentalist belief systems of every religion in the world. And I said, well, good. And he said, no, you don't understand what kind of power there is in that system. And mm. this was a scientist telling me this, not a religious mm. person. Mm-hmm. And when I what, how did the Vedas, how did the, in the ancient Indian uh, times of extraterrestrial violence, and you have to, you have to go along with that, right? I mean, that is really what uh, so much of the Sanskrit has been translated to mean, the Mahabharata, et cetera, they are talking about off-world violence, right, Stephen? Well, no, there's, what they're talking about are, what I, how I interpret that is that there's nothing new under the sun. There have been ETs having contact right. with humans for a very long time. There have been other civilizations that have had contact and developed the technologies as we have done covertly and then mm-hmm. ended up weaponizing them. I think it was for humans <laughs> who did that. So I think there's... No, but how did, the, how did the old um, Sanskrit text who discuss these technologies in terms of how powerful they are violently? How did they um, how did they come to terms with what they learned? Well, I think they I think eventually it ended up being if, if humans use this kind of technology violently, it means that civilization eventually becomes extinct. And I think there have been civilizations on Earth that are human that have come and gone because they've made mm-hmm. the same mistakes we're making now. And I think the big challenge right now is whether we're going to make the same mistakes over and over. You know, Ben Rich, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the super secret mm-hmm. uh, uh, Skunk Works, said, we have the means to take E.T. home. And he admitted that we already had developed this level of technology. But because it's being handled non-transparently, covertly, mm-hmm by a lot of people who, quite frankly, are sociopaths, there is a risk of this. And I think this is, begins to become the central question, is do we come together as a people and say, yes, these technologies exist, and they've existed mm. for a very long time. Do we put them to the use of enlightenment and free energy and a new civilization and a sustainable level one civilization, as Michikaku would say, or do mm-hmm. we slip back into what happened where it talks about in the Mahabharata and the Vedas of uh, some kind of weaponization of it that ends up being right. calamitous. Right. Th- this, that is this, our decision right now. That's is our, it's our choice. And I think the prime mm-hmm. directive, I hate to sound like a Star Trek person, but the prime mm-hmm. directive really is in play here. And there's a, tendency for people to try to blame things from from out, outside the planet or outside humanity and i think instead say, no, of taking responsibility for it I bingo mean. and i, I think i think that. i think we but, have to take responsibility for our own consciousness our own actions and our own future and manifest that future and if we do not take responsibility for it then there are, there are these other kinds of folks who are going to step into the vacuum so the the sort of complacency and apathy of the masses is what has to change because there's always going to be a power hungry uh, sociopaths, whether it be Hitler or Stalin or mm-hmm. uh, Dick Cheney or whoever it is, who are going to step mm-hmm. into going to step into that vacuum. And I think mm-hmm. we have to ask ourselves, well, why are we allowing that? Why are? And, and I always say to I always say to people, there's only one problem with nice people, is that they're nice. Nice people mm-hmm. get overrun by these psychopaths. So we have mm-hmm. to be, in this sense, Shambhala warriors, spirit warriors, mm-hmm. to stand up mm-hmm. to these elements and speak mm-hmm. with a clear voice and come together as a people. Uh, and I mm-hmm. think then we can make this change. Uh, every, you know, every whether you're looking at the ancient Hopi tradition or what's mm-hmm. in the Vedas or where have you, there is this sense that right now the time we're living 
and right now is the time where we can we can either slip into destruction and sort of this eschatological end of the world nonsense or we can actually create a whole new civilization and this is our choice this is our free will to do this so mm -hmm. it, it's an existential crisis and and i think it's not been dealt with well over the last well, I, I think the mistakes that were made, frankly, were before I was born. I was born in 1955, so, you know, by then the, the die was sort of set on the path we're on. But I think that everyone who's between the ages of senility and puberty is sort of have the responsibility now to make this change happen in a way that's towards enlightenment. Now, what do you think? Of the decision that Oppenheimer made, who, as you know, was mm -hmm. frequently, he was actually fluent in Sanskrit, etc. And he picked, you know, being from New Mexico, I don't know why I'm living in a place of such, <laughs> such ancient, technologically uh, superior peace, Hopi, right. many of the old Indian traditions. Why did he pick New Mexico? Okay, not because the trees were there and he went to school, no. And when I finally realized that he picked Los Alamos for the weapon of mass destruction was because the energy here in New Mexico is containment energy. So he had to go ahead and do it at the behest of, I guess, all the politicians, and certainly Truman gave the okay, and all of the... Um, nuclear scientists who said we've got to do this and stop the war what do you think of his decision to go ahead and open up the atom in an environment through um the energies of the old let's say vedic traditions of higher higher consciousness also visited mainly by off-world uh, superior nations okay still exists in New Mexico. That's why I'm here and why so many are. What do you think of this decision? Do the bomb, but make it contained. Well, I think, of course, the this is probably a story that's happened before where, where society has reached this point in technological development right. and has self-destructed. And if, if any, I mean, imagine what the technologies are, surely, to go interstellar to go from one star system to another, they're much more sophisticated than the atomic bomb or the hydrogen bomb. And if, mm -hmm. if, those, if this level of technology is weaponized, or let's put it another way, if the consciousness of conflict and destruction seizes upon that technology, then it is the end of that civilization. And that's why we we the choices that are being made are so critical at this time in history because i believe we've entered in the whole uh, if you want to get into the the vedic concept another whole mm -hmm. yuga a 500,000 sure. year of cycle and this is the, a kala yuga time no question and the, but this well it's the closing of of one yuga and the opening of another the next mm -hmm. yuga the next era is the time of global enlightenment, interstellar travel, uh, an unbroken level of peace, not only on Earth, but elsewhere. It's universal peace, not just world peace. And so we, we're at this point of a bifurcation, a choice. And we, now we have to get it right, because the last yuga, the last meta yuga, the big one, was about 450,000 years, where there's been the hallmark of that era was a rising to a certain level of development and then falling and rising and falling. Mm -hmm. Or there'd be an enlightened civilization such as the Shambhala kingdom and then it would vanish. Now, mm -hmm. the hallmark of this next yuga is how I understand it, is that the entire globe of the earth and mm -hmm. humanity will reach to a point of global peace but also interplanetary relations and peace. And that that is the next big step. So you can't, you can't fight the last war. You have to look into the future. What does the future hold? And I think the future is actually quite beautiful if we can get these issues right this time. But it really is a spiritual and consciousness problem as much no as question. it is or more than a technological one. But at the same time, if we don't get the technology right – and we stay on the path we are now, we're going to destroy the biosphere because of how but, stupidly we're living on it. But, Stephen, they're the same thing. 
The technology of the spirit is the fuel. Yeah, well, That's what actually, I have understood, and therefore it's not separate from consciousness. It no, it's is not separate. The consciousness, yeah. So that the well, technology the, the, of inter interspace travel is all in the heart and in the mind, not somewhere where you put it into a tube and shove it into your craft. Well, there are. There's both the consciousness that goes with it that allows that to happen, but also there are sciences. There are very specific sciences that allow for what are called transdimensional physics. And I know guys who work in these laboratories where they do this stuff. Um, but they're still that, relying on it being separate from the potential of their own consciousness. The trans yes, and, and this, is, this is the big problem. The people playing around with this kind of fire don't have the requisite level of consciousness to be doing it right. properly. And, right. and this, this is where you have the wrong consciousness seizing upon a technological capability, and that's where it can go sideways. So, no, I, do, I disagree with that statement. I don't think there is a separation. The, the psychological, the, the, the consciousness attitude, separate from the technology, no. But to me, they're the same. So when you realize, my God, we're talking about ourselves, not technology, right. that you are the technology. We are the fuel, period. Once you get that clear in your head, the scientists, they've got to come out of this closet, too, of not understanding that their transdimensional technologies are in their own hearts and their own minds. Right. Oh, yes. Well, that's totally true. But that, I'm talking about from the level of consciousness where they're operating, from the level of consciousness of what you're discussing, all of this is that. And, and that yeah. the mm -hmm. conscious mind, basically everything is consciousness. But when you yeah. begin to differentiate it into different spheres of relativity, and mm -hmm. incre you, you get into what I call uh, increasing levels of non-locality. Everyone thinks you're mm -hmm. either pure consciousness that's unbounded or mm -hmm. very fixed mm -hmm. relativity. And in reality, there are degrees of that. And once the understanding happens that all of this is that, and that if our true yeah, self yeah. is this expanse and that it becomes the operating system you're not going to even want to have the idea to harm other people and right, other worlds right so, so let that me is ask you something in relation to the, all of your studies of of contact perhaps or whatever do you think there is no conflict there is no polarity going on between other star nations themselves never mind earth well, I think that if there was a conflict, it would have been resolved instantly. Why? Because, Why would we know okay, anything about it? Here's the problem, and and I know I'm I'm talking now with a science hat on. I, I know people love to get into these sort of battles and what have you, but I, I don't view it that way. I what, the way I view it is that if a civilization has reached our level of development and hasn't chosen this state of universality of peace and universality of consciousness, they're going to self-destruct just like we're about to. And so it's very, I call it the imperative of consciousness in interstellar civilizations. In other words, mm -hmm. to become interstellar, you have to, at, at the minimum, have become a level one civilization or you implode on yourself. Well, now, I don't know about that. I don't really, I don't know. What, well, you can't prove a negative. All I'm saying is that if there were civilizations out there who really wanted to close out this deal, it would have been done in 1945. Uh, because I don't know that Earth has that much to do at, with You know, I mean, look, the, the level of, 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 of consciousness and technologies that would uh, attend interstellar, transdimensional, travel and teleportation mm -mm. if it mm -mm. was attached to if it was attached to, to a conflict that the, it would last a nanosecond before it's all over no so, but wait a minute how do you you wouldn't have to necessarily have 
conflict, although tell me how that's possible, between the point of views, and this is what I'm beginning to understand, it's not um, the polarity of good and evil, good and bad, light and dark, or any of that. Suppose the polarity is the consciousness of collectivization of the spirit, as opposed to the individualization of the spirit. And those are the two polarities. Now, that's a different kind of war. Well, actually, I think that, is again, I, well, this gets into a duality discussion that I, I think is transcended by the knowledge and wisdom of, of civilizations that are interstellar. Because you, you have this, where, the, where our planet will be heading is, on the one hand, will be increasingly united and connected to interconnected to each other. You could call that collective. But at the same time, the individual will be enormously empowered and the local level will be empowered. And I think these twinfold processes, which are viewed as at odds to each other, are actually, a, it's a paradox. They actually occur at the same time. Well, not really. I mean, look at what happened with, and a lot of some of these off world contexts that I, I have had have really used China and the United States as examples. That with the Long March and, um, and um, the Chinese experiment with human civilization being everyone will be collective as opposed to ours, which is individualization reigns. We will all get along even though we think and feel and our consciousness is individualized. All of these, both of these were trumped by materialism. Right. Sure. So, Absolutely. So, but we still don't have them. We don't, or do we? Maybe you know if there is a civilization that has successfully uh, solved the problem of collectivized consciousness. Yes, I think any. I think the civilizations that have gone interstellar have done so, although it's expressed in different ways. And I think that's the challenge that humans have, where we live, uh, we live together, and we realize the, the the singularity of consciousness that emanates within each of us, and where there's still the beauty of the expression of the individual. I honestly don't think those those are at, at opposed to each other. I think where it begins well, the problem is when it's and when it's opposed when it's imposed externally on a political system. And that's well, that's, that's what we have discussion. right now. That yeah, and exactly so the external right imposition now. of these things yeah. is a huge problem. Um, because you really can't imp you can't impose something like this. This is something that has to be like the lotus that unfolds. Well, I don't know. Tell me where you think we are, since we're supposed to be the leader of the individuated world and everybody uh, gets their own vote. Where are we here? And what are we doing <laughs> in this culture? I mean, please, are we going to make it or what? I, I think that it's a chapter that hasn't been written. I think it's a choice. Well, of course not, I think, but what is... <laughs> my, own view is that, my, my own view is that we will, but there's the school of hard knocks here. And, in, in, you know, there's a wonderful Chinese expression, unless we change directions, we're likely to end up where we're going. And, <laughs> and I love it. so where we're going and where we, we're heading is towards more and more uh, separation and destruction. And the worst of that would be for the leadership. And this is when I talk about the disclosure that serves the secret agenda. And that if, if, some, mm -hmm. if the disclosure that happens is about an us versus them mindset, the whole, what Werner von Braun said, look, you know, on his deathbed, be careful of this because they're going to try to say there's an alien threat we should unite against. And Reagan at the United Nations even said, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't our job would be of creating, you know, world unity be easier if we had a common alien threat? And I thought to myself when I heard that back in, because I was old enough to hear it when it happened, why do we have to have a threat and hate someone else in order to be united what, no, what no, is no. it in humans where we have to have someone to hate, someone other than us to hate in order mm -hmm. to be united? This is a sickness. Mm -hmm. I think this is a true social illness and a mental illness to, at, on an individual level. And I think that this is where the solution is bringing in 
it's not stirring around the darkness, as it says in the Vedas. It's bringing in the spark of light of the concept of this ineffable oneness that all of life and all well, of yeah, but some have. Sure, but sometimes the spark of light is what reveals the darkness is really there. Oh, of yes, old. and this, I think that's what's going on in this political climate now. Everyone is so fed up with everyone, but no, and everyone knows that something is very wrong with the system, but the real issues aren't being talked about. You don't hear any of our political leaders talking about the fact that right. we have the solutions to the environmental and the poverty and all these economic problems, but there are these global elites who are holding the solution back from us. And that, mm -hmm. in a way, even that is the wrong way to look at it. The question is, why have we, the people, allowed it to happen? And why don't we, the people, come together and change the direction? And that is exactly what the Disclosure Project and also the CE5 initiative. You know, when I learned that there were no overt diplomatic efforts going on anywhere at the United Nations or in any foreign ministry or State Department, to make peaceful contact and have a dialogue yeah. with these civilizations. Amazing. That's, when I found, Amazing. that's when I found the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative. Mm -hmm. and said, it's sort of like when the Fish Physicians for Social Responsibility went over to the Soviet Union during the darkest mm -hmm. days of the Cold War. And so I mm -hmm. said, why don't we, the people, do this? Why don't we understand right. the nature of our own consciousness? We're here. There are civilizations out there. And let's develop the ability to make contact. That was actually the original project I was involved with that then led to the Disclosure Project because when we first started doing this, we had the ET craft and being show up and the intelligence community went ballistic. They went, well, actually, I'll tell you exactly what the head of Army Intelligence said to me. He said, what the hell do you think you're doing and who the hell mm -hmm. do you think you are? And he was mm -hmm. very threatening, frankly. I told mm -hmm. him to just basically, well, I shouldn't say it on the air. I said, buzz off, buddy. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. anyway, I've dealt well, with the do, gangbangers in the know? ER. You're not going to intimidate me. But, okay, um, so then we're talking about the global elite money is, is actually calling the shots on the military? Yes. So here's, here's the sad part of the I, – I have met with so many generals and admirals who, if they're – you know, the, I call them the white hats, the good guys who are at the Pentagon or the CIA, and they exist, who are mm. victims of these other characters who mm. are running these unacknowledged special access projects. I mean, imagine me sitting with the, an admiral. This, this is a true story, Shirley. I'm sitting with an admiral mm. at the Pentagon who's in charge of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he's J-2. It's called J-2. Mm. And I go in there. Prior to the briefing, it's a stand-up briefing at the Pentagon, I give him a document from Nellis Air Force Base, Area 51, that has the project mm. code names and code numbers of these unacknowledged special access projects, USAP. And he, before I got to the meeting, he had tried to contact one. And Admiral Wilson, when he contacted this, this compartmented operation, they said, well, sir, you don't have a need to know. And he says, well, he said, God damn it, how can I not have a need to know? I'm, I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you. And they hung up on him. So by the time I got to the Pentagon, he was, he was so upset. He was so afraid, not, not at me, but of this situation. So you have mm -hmm. people who are trying to do the right thing, but who understand that there's this dark and subterranean uh, pro program that mm. evolved or devolved in the 40s and 50s. And yeah. this, is, this is when the whole thing went off the rails. You know, Eisenhower actually wanted to not go in this direction, make open contact with the ETs, and not do the secrecy. Well, so, did John, so did John F. Kennedy. But these, these yeah. other, these maniacs, and warmongers and misanthropic money whores ran amok of it. So mm -hmm. I, th I think this is, you know, there's a 50 or 60, 60 year history here that the public has no idea of what has mm -hmm. happened. And that's what's in this documentary, Unacknowledged, which I hope people will look at. I hope they'll support it. They can go to fundraising.seriousdisclosure.com and contribute. Right now we have about 3,500 people who've contributed and we're, we're in, in the final stretch of this. But we're also, for anyone listening, we're yeah. making a call for people to be whistleblowers. If there are other people who want to come forward beyond the ones we already mm -hmm. have, 
they should contact me immediately because we're we're in post production. We're we've already. Filmed. But you know, and good for you, Stephen. Fantastic. Just the word whistleblower. Definition is humiliation. I mean, think of another word. <laughs> Not well, in, it's, uh, it's people who are d telling the truth. It's, it's the truth. Yeah, it's a yeah, cosmic yeah. truth commission. We need people to be in the truth. Okay, cosmic. good. Okay, here's a tr cosmic truth commission, just like there happened <laughs> after Rwanda and in South Africa That's with right. apartheid exactly. and the racism. There needs to be a cosmic truth commission where people right. come forward and tell the truth. And there, the, the problem is, you know, I have interviewed about a, uh, let's see, about 750 or so of these sort of men and women who have been in these projects. Mm. Mm. We have 120 or so of them on videotape. Uh, mm. The ones that have contacted me lately are so intimidated because in right. these unacknowledged special access projects, it's made very clear, yeah. we're going to take your pension, but if you talk too much, we're going to kill you. Now, there's okay. a member of my team who was, uh, he's a naval commander, who was in one of these unacknowledged special access projects, and they were taken to an underground facility not far from you, and were basically told, look, you talk about this, and there's a bullet with your name on it. It's going to find you. Right. So, so a lot of times these people are so intimidated, and this is well, where... Well, Steve, all they have to do is use me as an example. Just keep on talking. My big, big cloak of protection is they think I'm a nut. Just go ahead. Well, not. That's, well, yes, and and the, and the media is is complicit in that portrayal. But remember, the, this this one of the great interviews we got for this new film is an Air Force counterintelligence officer who says, "Oh yes, I used to carry bags of cash to people in the <laughs> ma mainstream media to get them to do that." So so you know this is how the system works. Anyone listening. You know, if you think you have a free and impartial media, or if Hollywood is free and impartial, it's so mobbed up with the intelligence community you can't even imagine. No, well, here's another way I did it. I would call Johnny Carson's writers, or I would call David Letterman's another thing. He's a little off the planet for me. But most of these guys <laughs> have people who write stuff that would make like Shirley Plain jokes. So I would say to Johnny and them, let me help you write the jokes. So right. I was part of the comedy element of it all, and that's how you end up endearing yourself to the public, as long as it's funny. If it's not funny, you're sunk. So fix it <laughs> so it's funny, and it works. Yeah, that, well, that, that, it's, worked, it's worked to a point where we'll take it. You know, at least Jimmy Kimmel at least always asked whatever president or presidential candidate yeah. Uh, ask them about you this. You know, he asked China? Obama. He asked Clinton recently. Um, okay. and, and and to John Podesta's credit, uh, you know, when he left the Obama White House uh, last fall, about this time, he tweeted mm -hmm. out that his biggest regret of well, being he, in government. Doing, I know. Absolutely. Yeah, and 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 you know, he got he got involved with all of this after we did the disclosure project, but. I think that what we have to understand, a certain emperor has no clothes. Everyone assumes that, oh, you're the president of the United States, you have an all-access pass. Well, that's just a fan. No. no. I know. <laughs> Jimmy Carter told me. So did Bill. I ask all these people, and they tell me I'm only in for four years. I don't have a need-to-know basis here. So he that's said, right. I'll, call to you. I'll call you if I want to know something. <laughs> that's right. Also, well, actually, Jim. One, one, yeah. J Jimmy Carter, you know, had a UFO sighting, ran on a platform of, of disclosing the information yeah, back in the 70s. Not, and then right. he gets into office, and old man Bush is the CIA director that's the outgoing. And this is actually going to be in this new film. And we have a guy who saw the archives and was involved with this. And Carter wanted Bush Sr. to tell him, and, B and Bush Sr. said, I'm not going to tell you anything. Go see if you can get it from the Congressional Research Service and blew him off. And this is the incoming president of the United States. And uh, I have a friend who was at a dinner party with with Carter uh, not all that many years ago where someone said, what was it like being the most powerful man in the world? And Carter said, well, I wasn't that man. There were things I wanted to know about that they wouldn't tell me anything. And, and someone in the audience sort of giggling said, oh, what, things like UFOs? And President Carter said, yes, that and more. So, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is, that is the truth, and people listening need to understand that our political leaders, um, and, and this, of course, is a big problem, because 
we pretend we're in a democracy where there's a system in, and checks and balances in place. What I'm telling people is that it is to a point, but on, on this issue and, and ones related to it, such as the technology issue, that system broke down in the 50s, and we've got to fix it. And it's but our listen, responsibility. Steve, it's, I, I know, but the real tool here, just remember, just from my experience, we, have, we are in show business. We just are, all of life, particularly you guys now. So that if you understand that all of the application of the things you fear most in show business, which is they won't like it, you'll be humiliated, they'll laugh you off the stage, they'll never invite you back, blah, blah, blah. That's what we're suffering from. If you just go ahead with your new truth, as you're discussing now, it might be an entirely, um, first of all, you'll have a different way of bringing it up. There won't be fear there. We're in a world where we ex express um, an admiration for individual experience. Here's mine. Now, in relation to this, tell me what experiences did you have at that week in Joshua Tree? What happened there? Well, we had some beautiful experiences. We, well, it's based on the concept that we go into a deep, we, we use meditation. And then we go into a, a state where we remote view deep space and make contact with these civilizations. And we had mm -hmm. this beautiful, we had these two things that looked like stars that appeared. And they moved over. And we had a guy take an infrared picture. And it's this entire, mm -hmm. like a giant mm -hmm. extraterrestrial space station that's in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And while we're doing this, we have these electronic systems like uh, laser and radar detectors and magnetic field meters the ETs began to talk through them. I mean, we're out in the middle of an 800,000 mm. acre built witness. It, it, oh, I'd love for you to come on one of these. It would just blow your mind. Uh, and yeah. they began to talk. And then we have an object light up in the desert about 10 feet from us outside. It just lights up almost like a trans-dimensional. If you didn't know better, you'd say it was an angel, but it wasn't. It was a, an interstellar craft with these beams that are shimmering in it. How do and, we know the difference? Oh, well, you, you, there is. Uh, as, as Monsignor Balducci said, the angels don't need spacecraft. But um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't need a spacecraft. But um, we need to do, and, the, the, do the, uh, How about maybe the occupants of the spacecraft don't need the spacecraft either. But we wouldn't believe it if they weren't in it. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Well, and there are civilizations that are at that level of of cosmic consciousness, and yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's a, an amazing experience when it happens. And uh, what what we have now, we have a we actually have an app where people can connect to other people uh, to form these groups and go out under the stars. And it isn't just the sky watch; it's actually to go into these into a meditative state, remote view, deep space, and make contact. Now, some people mm -hmm. say, aren't you, aren't you afraid? I said, afraid of what? I said, although mm -hmm. every time we've had a, a, a major close encounter happen, jets have come in or military guys have come in. To try to <laughs> <laughs> because, because they try How to disrupt it. it. No, there, it's ridiculous. You wouldn't believe this is like some kind of a – it's like living in a movie to be on one of these weak ex expeditions. It really is. Like no, I say it's all show business. But how do, the, how do these jets know that you've drawn these other phenomena in? Um, well, the NRO satellites, the National Reconnaissance Office satellites, have what are called neutrino light detectors. And so when an mm -hmm. ET object comes, steps down out of the near astral – and the, let's call it trans-dimensional fields into 3D, it leaves a signature. And by 1974, they had developed neutrino light detectors that are on the, the satellites, and they pick it up okay. instantly. Okay, so I know the man who developed this, by the way, uh, who's in, who was, who's, whose technology was confiscated by the intelligence community to put on these satellites. So um, <laughs> it's, it's picked up instantly. And, and the people are very naive. You know, people think that, oh, well, I said, look, what Ben Rich said at the Lockheed Skunk Works, Lockheed mm -hmm. Martin, he said, mm -hmm. there are no private conversations anywhere on Earth, number one. Anywhere. <laughs> and then and, and, and forget about it. You can be on Mount Everest having a chat with no electronics, right. and they're going to hear everything you're no saying way. if they want to hear it. <laughs> right. So I said, but, but the technologies are really actually quite developed. And most people forget that by 
uh, the 1950s. We had by 19 October 1954 is when the uh, covert programs mastered gravity control. So we haven't needed mm-hmm. surface roads or freeways since 1954. That is a fact. So mm-hmm. the technologies are so well developed, and they can pick up an uh, extraterrestrial vehicle once it begins to come out of the interdimensional, transdimensional fields into 3D. And it, even if it's not fully materialized, it may be there almost as a light uh, energy. They'll pick that up instantly. And as Stephen Hawking told me, how do we know those technologies haven't got a consciousness of their own? Actually, the the, the main thing that I, I came forward with in 1990 was a paper talking about consciousness-assisted technologies and technology-assisted mm-hmm. consciousness, where there is a perfect interwoven nature of the consciousness and the technology. And this is actually a whole area of science and uh, that I discuss and give. In fact, I'm going to be at uh, Paula Harris's conference uh, in Nevada at the end of, uh, well, I think it's November 12th, actually, in Laughlin, Nevada. And this is going to be the focus of what I'll be speaking about is where consciousness and technology and the extraterrestrial phenomenon all come together. And that, there you go. Absolutely. It's the, it's the central it's the central focus of what I'll be discussing because if you don't understand the nature of what's inside yourself, the nature mm-hmm. of consciousness and mind, you're never going to understand the interstellar no. civilizations. Exactly. That's what I'll be discussing at there in um, Laughlin. Laughlin, huh? Oh, that's the seat of a lot of these places. Okay. <laughs> Why is it so funny? It's like, it's like the joke. The best and most intelligent thing that the devil ever did was to make people think he doesn't exist. <laughs> Hello? With, yes. <laughs> well, and also, uh, <laughs> the, the truth is actually in, within everybody. And once you understand that the consciousness that we have, the singularity that, that of consciousness at that level, mm-hmm. that every dimension and every star system is folded within each person. We're a conscious quantum hologram. In other no, but words, that is why that is why I'm very interested in the Orion point of of a collectivization. That that's fascinating to me. And and their home world got destroyed. So why are they doing this? By the way, do you have an answer for that? Well, I think that uh, there there as I said there's nothing new under the sun. Other not only have there been civilizations on earth that haven't gotten this right. There are civilizations mm-hmm. on other planets that haven't gotten this right. 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 And, and so are in the midst of it. And, and so, yes, but we're in a universal moment. So you can't judge the future by the past. It, it, the mm-hmm. cycle we're entering, as I understand it, is not just an Earth cycle. It's a cosmic cycle. And yeah. so we, we, instead of perseverating on the screw-ups of the past, we better start visualizing and apprehending and manifesting the good future of this next yuga. That's that's really what we need to focus on. Okay, but how do you plan a future? You must look at the present. How do you evaluate and imagine a future where Donald Trump is the president? How do you do that? <laughs> now we are getting it. Well, you know what? <laughs> Who knows? Well, uh, uh, e- even even a, a broken clock is right twice a day, so it it, it could be. <laughs> that... <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe he's the co- maybe he's the cosmic comic extraterrestrial. Maybe that is. Yes, but but at the same time, who knows? He may have a he, he may just be enough of a wild card when he finds out that all this chicanery is going on that he'll say, screw you, I'm not going to put up with it. So, you know, who, who knows? Um, I, I don't, you know, on the political <laughs> level, I, I sort of am an agnostic, and I go, well, it's, when, it's it comes, when it comes to policy and what have you, it's one issue. But when it comes to this subject, I found it doesn't matter if you're left or right or whatever it is. Right. Th- these power elites are going to do circles around you, and I don't care if you are a billionaire. That doesn't mean anything to these uber power elites that are really running the show when it deals with yeah. these large transnational. Right. They're, owned, they're owned. They're owned by their own money. 
Oh, well, they, well, they print it, don't they? And so <laughs> it's, it's, di it's digits on a balance sheet, but on top of it, when you're dealing with the power of these large uh, interlocking corporations that are international, and uh, what was it, a Swiss, a mainstream Swiss uh, organization uh, concluded there were about 17 families and corporations that pretty much <laughs> run everything. And uh, so, you know, I always say that it's masters and slaves, and guess what? We're all slaves on someone else's plantation. Um, but <laughs> No, but the masters are slaves to their own stuff. Exactly, and what we need to do is, is uh, we need to realize that we're going to opt out of that system and just say, you know, no, we're going to move on. But mm -hmm. part of it is that, actually, the very comical part of this is that people are brainwashed into thinking they can't do anything about it, and and <laughs> realize, realizing that you are you have within yourself the ability to do something about that is the first step to the enlightenment and the liberation. Mm-hmm. Okay, Most Steve, people great. say, oh, what can I do? I'm a housewife in Poughkeepsie. Well, actually, you can do a yeah, lot. Right. You can right. do a lot. That's... I mean, I, my joke is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a country doctor from North Carolina. Right. I oh, live in Virginia Madison, now. A house somewhere. Where from Virginia? Well, uh, near the University of Virginia. I have a farm near Thomas Jefferson's home. Oh, God, I love that. They're going to honor me at the UVA. In uh, around November fourth, I'm coming back. Oh well, let me know when you're coming because I'm, I'm I'm my home is right there. Okay, I'll get your number from Britt, and maybe we really will get together and talk about this, and you can come and see them honor me. <laughs> I would love that. I would love to, I would love it, and if you have time, you can you can come out to you can come out to my my farm in, in Virginia, and we can have a drink and look at sunset and talk about all of this. God, and just go to Jeffersonian material, anything, to get back to him. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> interestingly, if you read Thomas Jefferson's material, he, he warned of the unchecked power of the corporations overrunning democracy. I mean, he, he Jefferson yeah. was, uh, you know, a bit of a, well, apparently he was a pothead, but um, on top of it, he, he was one of the... <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, he was, mm -hmm. but but he was something of a real visionary sort of, you know, he, he was very prescient about the time we're in now where the corrupting influence of, of these sort of a, a transnational corporate interests would overtake uh, the, the, what they wanted to put the, in, the in new our experiment. democracy. The, yeah, new the experiment. Yeah, the experiment, the democracy experiment, yes. Yeah. Right, and, and Ben Franklin and all of those, John Adams, whom I'm related to apparently, they were all. They all believed in the plurality of worlds. And oh, well, absolutely. And discussions about that. Yep, absolutely. And and they had a, a, a deep understanding of uh, almost at a metaphysical level of, of this. And, yeah. We should yeah. dig out some of that material in some of, of Ben Franklin's letters about the beliefs and the discussions they had as they were forming this new republic and and expose that that this is the reason why we are americans or trying to be because of this exposure to the understanding that we're not alone well i know yeah we should and it, it was funny i had a knockdown drag out with this nut job who was telling me that well there is no separation of church and state in america this is some you know fundamentalist <laughs> tribal thumper and i said it Excuse me, my family were, were were literally the first losers to be prisoner of war with the British, trying to escape from people like you. And the mm -hmm. person was so shocked. I said, "You have no idea what America's foundation is." And uh, it, <laughs> I'm 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 well. I I'm not shy about expressing my opinion. But, no, but uh, see how it see how it's all show business, Stephen. It's oh all yes. about, oh, okay, yeah. What an entertainment is this? It's like some dumb, stupid, you know, late night, late night show that we're doing all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it is on one level, and another level, it's all very, um, like it's time. all very serious and inspiring, and I, I, I'm confident that we can, we can go forward uh, and sort of renew globally the the promise of a civilization that I think we began to have a glimmer of a couple hundred years ago. Oh, God, I hope you're right. Oh, boy, thank you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to get your number and bother you.
Great. I, we'd have a great time. Thank you so much. I look forward to, to seeing you and, and really I would like to tell you that if you if you're able to be at the premiere, we're, we don't have a date set, but we'll we'll be sure to get an invitation to you. Oh, are you kidding? Too unacknowledged? Of course I'll be there. Awesome. Will it be okay. on this planet, do you think? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <That's exciting. laughs> Thank you, David. So what a wonderful thing. I'm going to talk tonight to Dr. Stephen Greer. I've wanted to talk with him uh, again for some time. He is the founder of the Disclosure Project, which is the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Orion Project in Serious Technology Advanced Research. Let me just tell you that I think this is a, a really apropos moment to talk to Dr. Stephen Greer because of what on earth is going on in uh, this country with the election, the health, the um, mental health, and the um, kind of uh, exposure of how angry everybody is. Uh, I am in a way glad to talk on September 11th. Of course, we all remember where we were and what we were doing. But Dr. Stephen Greer is the father of the disclosure movement and he had a wonderful moment in May of 2001, um, a National Press Club event, which I watched, and so did over one billion people. And he was talking about um, the existence of extraterrestrial life forms visiting the planet potentially, and the reverse engineering of the energy and the propulsion systems of those crafts. Now, since I live in New Mexico, and of course everybody knows about Roswell, I've been interested in that for years and years too. So I can't wait to talk to Dr. Greer, which I hope he allows me to call him Stephen. He's been a lifetime member of Alpha Omega Alpha, which is the nation's most prestigious medical honor society, which I think is kind of interesting since we're talking about the different energies of the above and here. And he um, was, during his life and career, uh, the chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Caldwell Memorial Hospital in North Carolina. Some of you might have read his books. He's the author of four of them, 
and he talks about this. By the way, what's interesting to me really deeply is that he has studied Sanskrit and the Vedas extensively, and I spent a lot of time in India trying to understand whether there had really been um, extraterrestrial visitation and potentially a war in India thousands of years ago. Anyway, he's been seen and heard by millions worldwide on CBS, BBC, Joe Reagan, Discovery Channel, and now he'll be heard on my show. I am really privileged and honored to have you. Welcome, Dr. Stephen M. Greer. What was their reasoning? Well, the reason for it is because once they realized what the technologies were behind these interstellar vehicles, such as the objects that went down in Roswell, and they did. There were three of them, actually, that crashed there, right. um, not one. And once those began to be studied and they figured out the energy and propulsion systems, they realized that we would, if that was known to the planet, that we would no longer need oil or gas or coal or got it, utility. Got it. And there so, goes the global elite and the Illuminati and all the global rich people. Exactly. You're, you're talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets. Mm. So not right. billions. No one cares about a billion dollars anymore, unfortunately. It's, yeah. hundreds, it's trillions. So when, what, what I discovered, and this is what I've discussed with um, – uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, the former Minister of Defense of Canada, who is actually Wonderful a macro economic, yeah, he's a macroeconomics guy, and mm -hmm. he said he didn't understand the secrecy, and neither did the CIA director for mm -hmm. Bill Clinton back in the '90s. And I said, look, these technologies are so advanced that it would completely replace all the sources of pollution. We would have instead of 48 percent of the world's population, literally not have enough a pot to pee in, we would have a completely transformed macroeconomic system that would lift mm -hmm. all tides, except for the uber elite that want to keep mm -hmm. the world right. as it is. So once this was recognized, they slammed the door on this so hard you can't even, it was breathtaking. And they portrayed mm -hmm. Eisenhower. This is why Eisenhower made that famous yeah. speech, Beware the Military right. Industrial right. Complex. I mean, he Absolutely. was an anti-military. He was a five-star general, for God's sake. Right, right. So... But the technology part of this is the part of the story that has never been told. And this documentary we're doing, which right now is, is one of the top crowdfunded documentaries in history called Unacknowledged, we're, we're in post-production right now, mm -hmm. has dozens of these top secret whistleblowers, missile, uh, military whistleblowers, including one man who admits to the extent to which he is a counterintelligence officer carried mm -hmm. bags of cash to people in the mainstream media <laughs> to get them to cover this story up. Yeah. So, no, we have amazing – in fact, I was just in New Mexico um, in July interviewing this uh, lieutenant colonel. And mm -hmm. so what you discover as you go through this narrative is that it's really conscious mind in its infinite form. So I went out into space and became sort of this infinite mind shining within the vessel of – my individuality or through the vessel of my individuality and it was beautiful it was absolutely beautiful and from that i became incredibly interested in what the nature of consciousness is and the mind um, and these issues and it led me into the study of the vedas and eventually i became a meditation teacher and went all over the world setting up meditation teachers and this is predates my medical career um in my mm -hmm. late teens and early 20s in my misspent youth, as I joke, although while most people were doing crazy things like that, I was, you know, ex exploring consciousness. But mm -hmm. it really was a great foundation for what I eventually did in medicine and understanding the human condition, but also with the extraterrestrial question of when you become an interstellar civilization, what is that reality? And you realize it's trans-dimensional. It's a conscious reality that the cosmos is awake, and their technologies interface with thought and consciousness. And this was mm -hmm. led me to this, this concept of making contact with these civilizations using a number of, of technologies, uh, lasers and other things, but primarily through the conscious field and higher states of consciousness. So that's really what got me started. Now, when I started that project, which is called the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, or CE5 Initiative, we mm -hmm. had these craft appear right over us in Florida. 
And mm. people can go to our website, <laughs> seriousdisclosure.com, and see these. But what happened is that there were people, I, did, I didn't know all of them, who were embedded at that first event who were from the intelligence community. And these were friendly people in the military and intelligence community. <laughs> oh, really? Now, these, yes, because this is a matter of really beyond top secret interest. So sure. within a few months, I was being invited to briefings with the head of Army Intelligence and what have you. And within about a year, I was asked to brief President Clinton's CIA director on this issue. How and old were you then? I was 30, mid-30s. Mid I was in my mid-30s okay. then. Okay. And it was a bit bit intimidating, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm a you know a doctor in North Carolina and living kind of a normal life. I mean, I, I think normalcy is greatly overrated, frankly. But um, <laughs> <laughs> why pretend? But uh, I was, I, I, you know, to the extent one. May I call you Stephen? Sure, you can call me anything you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> don't don't give me that freedom. <laughs> no, no, you're, it's really I'm very happy to be on the show with you. I'm been looking forward to it. Thank you. Now this disclosure project, of course, I've been watching and stuff. Tell us how it's going and kind of what it is, and that'll start us off. And then I've got a bunch of stuff to ask you. Well, really, we're in the whole new phase of it. We just um, launched a campaign where, uh, essentially, I concluded after we briefed the Clinton presidency and, and their CIA director back in the 90s, that this is something that people are going to have to do. And yeah. uh, I had never intended to get involved in this at this level. And, you know, I have uh, four children and had an emergency medicine career. And uh, my real interest in this subject it stems from experiences I had when I was a late teenager. Uh, I had a near-death experience and then became a uh, Sanskrit scholar of the Vedas and then a meditation teacher. And I was really interested in the nexus of where consciousness and higher states of consciousness interface with mm -hmm. interstellar communication and technology. And this became a really big focus of mine for, you know, for over the last 40 years. But Stephen, wait a minute. Let me ask you: when you when you had your near death experience, first of all, what caused that? And second, is that when you started to be interested in the Vedas? Yes, I was raised a very devout atheist, <laughs> and um, <laughs> my 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 family didn't believe in anything if it didn't exist in a test tube. And as you may know, my mm -hmm. um, my mother's um, brother was one of the guys who designed the lunar module that put the first man on the moon. His company was Northrop Grumman. And so what happened is I was being a, a stupid teenager guy, and I had an injury on my left leg and bicycled 200 miles in one day, and it spread all that infection all through my system. Ooh. And um, I was raised very poor. Um, we didn't have anything. We didn't have doctors, so I didn't go see a doctor. And... I just got sicker and sicker and had a near-death experience, which I spontaneously healed from this injury. Never did go mm. see a physician. That's another whole long story that's in my first uh, one of my books called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that I had an out-of-body experience. And for me, the experience was about the experience of the true nature of the concud, having had my background. But what was shocking to me is that I discovered that both the, the Clintons and their CIA director were being denied Podesta? access. Yeah, no, the CIA director was R. James Woolsey. Podesta had been the chief of staff for them. And but then he was very we, interested in this stuff, wasn't he? Oh, he still is. And if you you know if you've yeah. been following the campaign with Hillary, he's the campaign chairman, and he and Hillary both have been speaking openly about UFO disclosure yes. yeah. um, during the right. last year. But right. when I started this effort, it was really an accident of history, I guess is what I'm saying, because I really never intended to get involved with this end of it. But I started doing kind of shuttle diplomacy up to the U.N. with Boutros Boutroskali and into Washington meeting with members of uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee members, et cetera, and so on. And okay. people were extremely interested, but what I discovered – and this gets us to what we're doing right now um, with this new project, is that these projects are so deep black that they're called unacknowledged 
special access project. <laughs> now the, that that's the title that's the title of the documentary we're doing right now. We're doing a documentary that's going to be so explosive, and I hope you can come as my guest <laughs> to the premiere when we get it finished. Oh, I'd time. love to, Stephen. Oh, I'd love to. Absolutely. And as you're I'd, certainly I'd being. I'd like to be unacknowledged, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I'll come in as disguised as Mr. Magoo, but um, <laughs> I'm just joking. But I think that the, 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 this led to a series of, of uh, discoveries on our part, not just my part, but my military advisors and people like that who began to come around this project for the Disclosure Project, and that is there's almost two parallel worlds out there. There's the world that the president and the Congress normally deal with, with, you know, terrorism and taxes and Medicare and what have you. And then mm -hmm. there's the world of the UFO issue and extraterrestrial intelligence. And beginning in the 1950s, from the best we can reconstruct, on Eisenhower's watch, these operations went completely unacknowledged, meaning so black that they would not acknowledge their existence. Mm -hmm. So a special access project is, you know, th those are a dime a dozen. There's no, you know, 900,000 people with top secret clearances and various special access projects. Let me stop for a second, Stephen. Why did it go so far under? What well, is their what, what is their acknowledgement? 